started with Woodswan Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation about hurricanes, the future of coastal cities, with Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Dr. Jeff Donnelly. We've still got a lot of people joining us, so thank you for your patience. Thank you. 
It all starts with one drop, one insight, one eureka moment that can ripple across the planet. Every atom, particle, and molecule means we're connected. Every step we take, every discovery we make shapes our future. When faced with uncertain times, we turn to science for answers. And this is an uncertain time. Will our leaders rise to the challenge of climate change? Will we have the vision and technical prowess to end hunger through sustainable fishing and farming of the ocean? Will rising seas consume our coastlines? Will understanding outpace industrialization in time to save coral reefs, right whales, and threatened ecosystems around the globe? For more than 90 years, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution has been on call for our oceans driving discovery and providing the fundamental knowledge needed to respond to disasters, shape enlightened policies, and inspire individual action. It starts with one drop, one insight, one moment. Advancing together for uncertain times, together for science, together for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Please join us. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it for short. HUI's Ocean Encounters online events are made possible in part by the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Th Philanthropies. Thank you. My name is Veronique LaCapra. I'll be your host for this evening. Before we begin tonight's conversation, I'd like to take a minute to get a sense from where people in the audience are tuning in from today. If you have joined us on Zoom, you should see a pop-up poll on your screen shortly, asking you to indicate the region where you live. Um, as I often say, who is on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and we usually get a lot of viewers tuning in from the Northeastern US. But if you're from somewhere else, please let us know. The poll choices won't cover everywhere, but please pick the one that's closest to where you are. And we should be getting that poll pretty soon here. There we go. All right, while that poll is running, here are some tips on how you can optimize your Zoom event experience with us. Throughout our conversation tonight, our guests will be taking questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question into the window that appears. You may be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but for tonight, please use the Q&A button instead. We often get hundreds of questions, so unfortunately we can't get to all of them, but we'll do our best. You can ask questions at any time, starting now. And we've got the results of that poll. Um, as I expected, lots of folks from the Eastern US, about 60%. But we've got a good uh, spread of people joining us from the Southern US, Western US, and Central US. And um, wow, even some folks from uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, and Africa, and Central and South America. So that's great. All right. Um, and just to let you know, we had over 1,000 people pre-register for this event. So you're in good company. Welcome to everyone. All right, let's get started. The topic of tonight's event is hurricanes, the future of coastal cities. Coastal cities lie at the intersection of many issues, ocean and climate, ecosystems and human infrastructure, and a rapidly growing population on a constantly changing landscape between land and sea. Our safety, economic security, and cultural growth depend on us learning how to live more wisely in this complex landscape. Sea level rise and other fundamental changes, I'm sorry, sea level rise and other fundamental changes are already reshaping coastal cities around the globe, whether this evolution is incremental or in the case of hurricanes brings dramatic and often wholesale changes. We need multidisciplinary collaborative solutions that focus on supporting communities through uncertain times. Joining us to talk about the future of coastal cities in the context of climate change are Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Dr. Jeff Donnelly. And we should be seeing them soon here. Um, 
Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson is a marine biologist, policy expert, and Brooklyn native. She is founder of the nonprofit think tank Urban Ocean Lab, founder and CEO of the consultancy Ocean Collective, and co creator and co host of the Spotify Gimlet podcast, How to Save a Planet. She also co edited the anthology All We Can Save, which I have right here, as it turns out. Um, and co-founded the All We Can Save project in support of women climate leaders. Her mission is to build community around climate solutions, and you can follow her at, uh, at Ayana Eliza. Dr. Donnelly is a marine geologist and the director of Hui Seafloor Samples Lab. His research aims to understand how variations in climate affect tropical cyclone activity, sea levels, and the availability of water. He also studies the impacts of our changing climate on terrestrial and coastal landforms and ecosystems, using the record of past environmental changes to predict what could happen in the future. Thank you both for joining us. And thank you also to everyone who tuned in to join us tonight. And Sorry, my view here is a little bit messed up. We seem to be having a little trouble connecting with Ayana. Um, hang on one second. Okay, folks behind the scenes are working, but uh, let me get started in that case with, with Jeff, who is here. Um, Jeff. Um, I briefly introduced both of you just now, but I'd like to start with having you introduce, take a minute to introduce yourself um, and tell us a little more about yourself and about the kind of research that you do. Um, all right, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, so my perspective is as a geologist, so I tend to think a little deeper in time than most people. I think our personal uh, perspectives uh, are very limited. Um, you know, we have a lifetime of maybe 80 years and even our societal experiences really only take us back a couple of centuries at most. Um, and that's pretty short when you're trying to understand the Earth system and how it works. Um, so the, the focus of my research is to extend that observational period uh, back in time as much as we can uh, to say something about how the environment's been changing and what causes that to really provide a framework for, for understanding what the changes are we're experiencing now and what we might see in the future. All right. We seem to still be having some trouble. There's Ayana. Hi, uh, you're you're on mute. Sorry there about that. Go. I no got the problem. you know spinning rainbow death spiral on my laptop just as you were introducing me. I just shut down <laughs> my computer and, and give it the old reboot. Sorry about that. Well, we're very glad you're back and you're back just in time to uh, do, uh, take a little time to reintroduce yourself. Um, and in particular, I'd be interested to hear more about uh, the Urban Ocean Lab, uh, as well as anything else you'd like to share. Great. Um, first, I'll say, I'll say I'm so excited to be a part of this event. I have um, a large soft spot in my heart for Hui. Um, it was my first job out of college as an undergrad um, was um, working at the Marine Policy Center. Um, at Woods Hole. And so um, I'm so enamored with all of the, the work, all of the research that happens there. Um, and that was where I got my start really, like really thinking about ocean policy. And that's a thread that has carried through my work ever since of connecting science um, to how we need to rewrite the rules of the game. And that's actually what Urban Ocean Lab is. It's a think tank for the future of coastal cities. Um, as we know, coastal cities are really threatened by our changing climate um, in terms of sea level rise, in terms of storms and heat waves. Um, our infrastructure is at risk. Um, and there are also lots of things that we can do um, to reduce that risk and to design, envision um, a more livable future. And then, you know, and create the policy framework that would enable us to have that future. So one of the first things we've worked on is um, offshore renewable energy. We just released our first policy memo around what it would look like to expand that industry in the US, thinking about um, what is needed at a federal level in terms of both um, you know, executive 
uh, branch and, and Congress um, legislative branch actions. Um, and we're now working next on something that is um, very near and dear to my heart, which is this question of what does a blue new deal look like? So we know what a green new deal is sort of, I think a lot of people haven't really read what that proposal is. So I'll just say um, the proposal is only 14 pages. It's double spaced, big font. It'll take like five minutes to read the Green New Deal resolution. So I highly recommend that because I think we need to have as a society, a conversation about what our climate policy should be um, at the comprehensive federal level. And it helps to know like what the proposals are. So it's actually super short. That's the secret. Everyone thinks it's like hundreds of pages. Um, but when I read it, I got to page 10 and saw the first mention of the ocean and the ocean is sort of like mentioned in passing as like a list in a list of things we should protect. And I read that and was like, we're not going to solve this problem if we leave out the ocean, right? The ocean is not just um, a place that's getting pummeled by climate change, by warming waters, by ocean acidification, by the changes in currents and storms. It's also the source of a lot of our major solutions. Um, and so I've been kind of like on the march trying to talk about the importance of ocean, the ocean in our climate system and, and what that means for how we should shape policy. So that's, that's what Urban Ocean Lab is. is it's a think tank for um, ocean climate policy focused on the future of coastal cities. All right, there's so much I want to delve more into in what you just said. Um, but first, I think we're going to go to another poll uh, for our audience. And uh, let's see if we're ready with that or not. There it is. So um, the audience has already seen in our, in our pre-show slideshow several questions about hurricanes. Uh, but hurricanes are actually part of a larger group generally known as uh, tropical cyclones. And is that correct, Jeff? That's correct. Tropical cyclones. OK, that occurred uh, not just in the Atlantic Ocean, but in the Pacific Ocean and Indian Oceans and around the world. Um, and so your question, as you can see, is what was the costliest tropical cyclone in terms of human lives lost? Just want to point out that says on my screen, host and panelists can't vote. So I'm just trusting all of you <laughs> to get this right. <laughs> Jeff and I can't weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. OK. And we have the answer, which is the great Bola cyclone in the Indian Ocean. Um, each of the storms actually listed there was among the deadliest in its ocean. Um, but the great Bola cyclone was the deadliest of all, killing somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 people, mainly in Bangladesh. Um, and this really points out uh, the particular vulnerability of people living in uh, many parts of the Indian Ocean coast and in other regions of the world where large storms intersect with densely populated low-lying coastal areas and a lack of social safety nets. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that includes right here in the U.S. in some areas. Absolutely. All right, let's get back to our conversation. Um, Ayana, scientists are often reluctant to get directly involved in shaping policy or advocating for particular mm -hmm. actions or outcomes. Um, and we do have a marine policy center, as you said, here at Huey. I think a lot of people don't know that about us. But um, you, know, you started your career uh, as a marine biologist, and now your work really centers around developing climate policy and solutions for coastal cities. Can you tell us more about how you made the transition from an more of an environmental science to public policy? Mm -hmm. I mean, you started to tell us that by saying yeah. about your experience at Huey, but um, if you could sort of delve into that more, because I think there is sure. often this reluctance on the part of scientists to get involved in, in yeah. policy. And First so, I'll say, I you think see that is the role for science. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think that reluctance that you describe is actually um, waning as you know as we have this. Sort of generational shift in 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 the scientific fields that it's so hard it's impossible now to ignore the implications of your research right we're not studying pristine ecosystems we're studying changed ecosystems changed oceanographic systems um, and you know there's there's a um, a motivation that comes along with that to make sure that you're 
research is being used to make good decisions, right? And scientists are now much more you know, motivated and engaged in um, making sure that the results of their, their studies get out into the world, into the hands of people who need them to make good policy. It's not that scientists need to become policymakers or even science communicators. It's that it just has become ever more critical for that science to get into, into good hands and to be, um, to be used. Um, and so I think we, we are having a new generation of scientists that's determined not to let their research be a tree that falls in the forest, right? And so there's a lot, um, a lot more um, sort of next generation scientists who are focusing on science communication, who are building relationships with policymakers and all of that. So I'll just say from my personal experience, this is sort of like a weird thing to admit, but I never thought I would be like a research scientist professionally. Um, which is maybe strange to go and get a PhD in marine biology when you have no intention of like pursuing an academic research career or a government or industry research career. I just thought like, I wanna learn everything I can about the ocean so that I can be useful um, when it comes to conservation, when it comes to policy. That was sort of always my plan. Um, and, you know, I had that childhood wonder and awe when, when I sort of like first met the ocean um, and some of the marine species that lived in it. And of course I was completely enamored and was like, I'm going to become a marine biologist. That is, that is the plan. Um, but you know, like most people, I, I'm interested in a lot of different things. So that was when I was five, when I first learned to swim and uh, went on a glass bottom boat in Key West, Florida and held a sea urchin in the palm of my hand and was like, tell me everything about echinoderms, like what are tube feet? This is the best thing ever. Um, and then, you know, sort of five years later, learning about the history of the civil rights movement, I was like, actually, I have a new dream job. It was extremely specific. I was like, I would like to be the lawyer that gets the next Martin Luther King out of jail. I want to be a, like a, a super helpful civil rights lawyer. And then I thought, um, you know, five years later, I went backpacking for the first time in the Rocky mountains. And I was like, well, obviously being a park ranger is the best job. Like <laughs> we get paid to walk around in the forest. Like that is going to be my job. Um, and when I was in college, I majored in environmental science and public policy because I knew that I wanted this interdisciplinary major. I wanted this um, ability to understand not just the science, but the, the policy and the politics and the economics um, and the law that goes into all of this. So I took all those courses um, at once and then ended up um, at Hui in the Marine Policy Center, which is the, the cottage right across the street from Pie in the Sky for those who are familiar with Woods Hole. Um, and, and it was, it was amazing for me to have that opportunity to start thinking about ocean zoning, just like we do on land. There's this opportunity to think about like, how do we want to use ocean space? There's so many different things happening in the ocean. Like we should have a plan for that because on land, we usually have, you know, land use zoning and, and planning. Um, and that has been something we've largely skipped for the ocean. So that's when I started thinking about that and then, you know, ended up in graduate school, working in the Caribbean, doing all this scuba diving research, um, trying to understand how to make fishing more sustainable by like redesigning fishing gear. It turns out if you put like a hole in the side of a fish trap, then the small fish get out and you can waste less fish. <laughs> Just like, of course, right? But you, see, you need to do this, this experiment 300 times in, in three different locations with all different types of trap designs to get the statistical rigor that you need to prove that like fish will swim out of a small hole in the side of your trap. Um, <laughs> and that fish, fishermen won't lose any money, which was the important addition to that work so that governments would feel comfortable adopting this new trap design as policy, which has happened in a bunch of different Caribbean islands. Um, and then I realized that like, this is actually not about fish, right? This is about fishermen. This is about people. This is about how we use the ocean and like, how can we rethink our relationship with the ocean and, and, and redesign that to be more sustainable. So I just basically stopped doing um, what we think of as marine science and started interviewing fishermen and interviewing scuba divers and saying, tell me what you're seeing. How are things changing? Doing that sort of historical ecology um, and behavioral economics. Like how are you making decisions? How, how does money play into how you exploit the ocean? 
Um, and if you could write the rules to manage the ocean, what would they be? And that was the start of my really deep work um, in, in ocean policy and working with communities to design what that should be. And so I've had what looks in hindsight like a very linear path but none of it was planned in advance. It was just sort of, you know, the, I'm just so grateful that I've had um, the advisors and the you know, research funding that's enabled me to follow my nose, um, not quite knowing where it would lead, but seeing like around the corner, like, okay, so what if we collaborate directly with island governments? And what if we, you know, what happens if I work for the US federal government on ocean policy? How can I be helpful there? Um, and sort of that's all led to this current incarnation, which is, well, no one's really focused on coastal cities and the intersection of science and policy there. So, so that's, um, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. So I'm from a coastal city. New York has 578 miles of coastline, which we often forget and seahorses and whales that are coming through New York Harbor. Um, it's a vibrant um, estuarine ecosystem that, um, that we have man not managed to kill despite some really good efforts. So um, I'll just say, that, I mean, I think that's, that's the place where I find inspiration, right? Nature is so resilient um, and we have this opportunity to, to think, rethink our relationship with different species and ecosystems and figure out how we can sort of like back off a little bit and let let nature um, nature recover, which is ever more important in the context of a changing climate that puts so much more pressure um, on all these species. So Jeff, tonight we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, a changing climate and its, its impact on coastal communities. We hear in the news a lot about communities flooding from storm surges and we know that sea levels overall are rising what are the main drivers of rising sea levels and, and how do we know that the seas are rising? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that, that contribute to the, the sea rising. The one that's sort of the most obvious is that you're actually adding water to the oceans, right? So we're, we're melting ice from ice sheets and, and glaciers and adding that volume to the ocean. And that's a process that's been going on for thousands and, and even millions of years um, you know, 20,000 years ago, there were large glaciers over, over Europe and in North America. Those melted away and, and added over 300 feet of, of sea level rise. Um, sea level has been relatively stable for several thousand years, but it's only in the last 100 or 150 years that we've seen it, it, the rate of rise increase again. And actually, we haven't seen the rate of rise we're, we're seeing today in about 6,000 years. So it's basically as that last ice age was was waning and we were getting rid of the last of those ice sheets was the last time we saw sea level rise rates um, of the magnitude that we're, we're measuring today. Um, there's other components uh, to it as well. As we warm the oceans, they actually take up more space. They expand and um, take up more, uh, more of a volume. So that contributes to the rise. And then there's also lots of things that contribute to, to local sea level changes. Um, for example, changes in ocean currents can, can change uh, uh, sea levels locally. Uh, and then there's also the fact that the land level changes. Uh, and that's actually a, a process that's, that's going on uh, in Cape Cod right now. So in, in um, Cape Cod, about a millimeter or so per year of the sea level rise that we see is actually because Cape Cod is sinking. Um, and the reason it's sinking- well, Yeah, why is that? Well, we've lost uh, uh, mantle material. Because, so, when the ice sheet was, was parked over Cape Cod, which in that ice sheet was in part what formed Cape Cod and the islands, when it was there, it depressed, it was so heavy that it depressed mantle material out beyond Cape Cod, out into the, into the ocean floor. As that ice sheet melted away, that mantle material is now slowly rebounding back towards the center of the ice sheet. So Hudson Bay in Canada is actually uplifting um, whereas here in Cape Cod, the mantle material that's causing Hudson Bay to uplift is coming from underneath Cape Cod. So we're sort of getting a bonus sea level rise here on the southern New England coast. Um, I don't know if I would call it a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. All right, maybe not a bonus. <laughs> we're getting some extra sea Ex level extra, rise. Extra, for sure, right. extra. Right. Yeah. Um, but so what's going processes on are, are like things that... Uh, the, the rate of rise there, so that millimeter a year of rise 
is is getting swamped by the the human signal. So now that the the climate is warming so much, we're losing so much um, volume of ice sheets and glaciers. Uh, the ocean's expanding because it's warming up. Um, the rate of rise now is you know three four times the the rate of rise I was talking about from the, the subsidence here in Cape Cod. And by you know the end of this century, it's probably going to be something like ten times that. So it's, it's dramatically different rates of change. And as I said, rates of change that we haven't seen in, in you know, over 6,000 years. And that is actually, you know, imagine the, the, you know, those ecosystems that Ayana was talking about, they basically formed over the last several thousand years in this very different sea level regime, right? Um, you know, salt marshes, for example, became very expansive in the last four or 5,000 years because the rate of sea level rise had slowed and allowed sediment to fill in and, and form these, these large marsh systems. Um, now the rate of rise is so rapid that those marshes in, in a lot of areas aren't able to keep up and we're starting to lose, with, they're starting to change their composition. Um, the, the vegetation that occupies them is, is changing to, to different species and it doesn't have room in, in many cases to migrate uh, landward because we've built fixed uh, infrastructure there. Um, so it, it's a big deal in terms of not just sort of drowning the infrastructure that we put in place, but it's a big deal in terms of the, the natural ecosystems that are out there. I want to take a question from the audience, which is related to the flooding that we were talking about earlier. Um, Philip would like to know which coast in the U.S. is more likely to suffer flooding. Um, and uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll give that to you. But... Um, so you were talking about how sea level rise is not going to be the same everywhere. Right. Um, and you know, one of the things I didn't talk about is that there's also, it, it matters where the, the water is coming from, from the ice sheets. There's a, turns out there's a gravitational attraction to the ice sheets, right? Their ice sheets are so large that they actually pull the ocean towards them. And if you lose a lot of the, the mass of Antarctica, for example, um, you actually get extra sea, I won't say bonus sea level rise, you get extra sea level rise um, here in the, in the North Atlantic. Um, the opposite is true if you lose a lot of ice from Greenland. Um, and so depending on how the scenario plays out, there'll be, there'll be losers and then really big losers in terms of how much sea level rise um, people see. Um, right now, the people that are most vulnerable are the people that are in very low lying areas. Um, so for the most part, the, the West Coast it you know, has quite a bit of topography, um, but much of the East Coast and, and the Gulf Coast is fairly low lying. And those are the areas that are, that are most vulnerable um, to the sea level rise we're seeing. Makes sense. That's actually my mother's favorite ice fact is that these large ice sheets have their own gravitational pull. And so as they, they melt and the water sort of like moves away from them yeah. that sort of like ice melting at one pole causes sea level rise on the other side of the planet, which is right. wild, right? Like it's so right. important to think about how these larger systems are connected. I remember my mother explaining this to me, like I'm the one with the PhD in ocean science. She was like, Hannah, did you know? And I was like, oh, I never thought about that before. That's great. And we didn't, yeah, you know, the scientific community wasn't really paying attention to that until maybe 15 years ago. You know, when I was a graduate student, that wasn't something we were thinking about. It's a, yeah. sort of a new new discovery. So your, your mother mm -hmm. read. She's on it. Yeah. Ayanna, uh, I wanted to get back to your work on um, engaging communities in, in climate policy. What are the mm -hmm. major challenges you're seeing? And, and can you give an example of a recent project where you've worked collaborated, collaboratively with a community to, to, solve, to develop solutions? So the largest community engagement project that I've done around ocean and climate was when I was executive director of the Weight Institute and um, leading the Blue Halo Initiative, which has now been renamed, I think, Blue Prosperity Coalition. Um, ah, that is a photograph of me um, launching that program in Curacao, which is also where I did my PhD research, which um, was very useful because I could make pretty lame jokes in Papiamentu, which is the local dialect, uh, which opens a lot of conversations when you can um, understand at least a little bit. Um, and so that was an incredibly formative 
experience because, you know, and it grew out of my PhD research, which was, um, you know, this multi, uh, multi-faceted approach at, at looking, uh, looking at what sustainable ocean management would look like. Um, and sort of the word sustainability in general doesn't really mean anything. Um, and so as we were developing the Blue Halo initiative, that became, how do we use the ocean without using it up? That's just what we talked about with people. Like, what would that look like to make sure there's enough left and that we're restoring things instead of depleting them? Like, there's so many ways to get there. Um, so let's talk about what would work for you. And so it really is like going sort of door to door. And and I was, you know, working on relatively small Caribbean islands. Curacao was the largest. We started working in Barbuda um, and then in Montserrat and then in Curacao. Um, and, you know, the most important thing is that processes of developing policy be not just participatory, but also very iterative, that people have a lot of chances to weigh in as the concepts evolve. Um, and so the work in Barbuda ended up being, um, you know, they created one of the mo mo arguably the most progressive um, and comprehensive ocean policy of any any island in the Caribbean, um, protecting a third of their um, coastal waters, protecting seagrasses and mangroves completely, protecting parrotfish and urchins completely because they're such important herbivores that eat algae, um, excess algae off of coral reefs. Um, you know, set it, setting up zoning around the island, that same topic that I started working on um, it, it, at Woods Hole, you know, in 2002, 15 years later, I was doing that work with th these Caribbean islands. And so Barbuda- what that means it, with zoning when you're talking about the ocean. Yeah. So what that looked like in Barbuda was, you know, asking people, what are the, what are the key uses of the ocean, right? And they talked about needing, needing areas dedicated to fishing, needing areas where people could anchor their boats, needing an area for where ships come and go, like in the port, like a shipping lane, um, and wanting conservation areas and, and areas that were dedicated for cultural use. And so what that meant was that we, we, we literally sat down with individual fishermen and business owners and community members and said, like, let's draw the map of where you think those zones should be. Um, and then sort of go through all of these drafts and iterations with the local government to come up with a final map um, that they sort of signed into law. And so there are these zones that are created by law of, of where you can anchor, where you can fish, where you can't fish. Um, and they can put in new zone types in the future if they need a zone for offshore wind energy or for aquaculture. There's a, a policy framework for adding new types of zones. And so the, the concept there is like, we can't just all do whatever we want, wherever we want all the time in the ocean and expect that to work out well, right? Like we need a plan. Um, and so that's, that's what that work looked like. Um, and after two years of, of doing that work, um, Hurricane Irma hit Barbuda and Barbuda was in the eye of that storm and lost all connection, all communications, all cell phone service, internet, everything down. Um, and we didn't know if anyone had survived for like two days, there was no word. Um, and like magically there were only two deaths during that storm, but the stories people t tell are, you know, just of, of, of knowing they were in the eye of the storm, leaving you know their completely destroyed homes to try to find a more stable building before the other half of the storm hit them, right? Um, and to me, it was this horrible lesson that you can do literally everything right at the local level. You can invest in sustainability and marine protected areas and have good fishing regulations and a zoning plan and commu deep community engagement. And then because of climate change and the way that a warmer ocean fuels stronger and wetter storms, you can still be screwed, right? Like, and so we have to do both of these things at the same time. Of course, the local efforts are still important and we need to do them. We also have to deal with climate change or else hurricanes and other manifestations of our changed and changing climate will become even more, um, even more dangerous. So that was 
um, you know, the kind of thing that you, you know academically, but to see it all mash up like that in the real world was really a wake up call to me. And, and one of the reasons that my work has um, shifted more solidly from a, a specific focus on, on the ocean to making sure that I'm working at this intersection between ocean and climate science and policy. Jeff, Ayana mentioned uh, that storms and hurricanes are getting more frequent and more intense as the ocean gets warmer. Wh why is that? Can you explain sort of the mechanisms behind that? Sure, yeah. So they're different from extratropical storms. So, you know, extratropical storms are getting their energy from the, the air masses that are sort of um, at battle um, in, the, in the mid latitudes. A tropical cyclone gets all of its energy from the sea surface, right? So it's, it's effectively a heat engine that's drawing all its energy from, from the surface of the ocean. And so as we warm the oceans um, through our activities, we're actually providing more energy for the storms. Um, and so most of the, the modeling that's, that's going on trying to look at this points to maybe not an increase in the overall number of storms, but the storms that we do see are likely to be more intense. And of course, those are the ones that we care about because the more intense storms are the ones that do most of the damage and, and, and threaten most of the lives. So um, you know, most of the work that's going on now, trying to project what will happen in the future, paints a fairly um, difficult uh, picture for us in the sense that we've, you know, we've got lots of coastal infrastructure and that's sort of in harm's way. And you know, we're sort of potentially supercharging these storms. Um, and um, you know, that's sort of a, a, a bad mix. Um, the other thing that Ayana mentioned is that it's not just the intensity, but one of the very clear patterns that come out of the, the climate modeling is that the storms will bring more water with them. So there'll be more uh, precipitation. So you know, not only are you getting hit by the high winds and the storm surge, but you also have um, you know, more inland flooding um, related to that greater precip that comes in with the storm. We've had a whole number of, uh, of examples recently of, of storms that have dumped, you know, a considerable amount of, uh, of uh, water on, on coastal cities. You have Harvey a few years ago, and then just, uh, you know, in this, this season, we've had Sally and now Beta um, dumping, um, you know, 20, 30 inches of rain in some places. So. Yeah. So I want to take another question from the audience, and I'm drawn to this one because it's a uh, a little uh, surprising to me as a question. It's interesting. Um, have the fires on the West Coast had any effect on the direction of hurricanes in the Atlantic this September? Um, there's you know, anything you put into the atmosphere in great volumes is going to have lots of effects. Um, I don't think anyone's ever looked at that. Um, there's certainly a lot of evidence that there's um, African dust coming across. I was going to say particulates. Has there been any right. study of And so, you know, it follows that if you're putting a lot of particulates in the atmosphere from, from the other direction, it has the potential at least to have some impact on tropical cyclone activity. But I think, I don't think anyone's ever, ever looked at that. And we haven't really seen, um, you know, the level of fire that we're seeing right now. So it's sort of, a, it's a grand experiment that we're, we're sort of um, having unfold before our eyes. Um, Lisa would like to know whether there are some natural solutions to mitigate sea level rise rather than, you know, the kind of hard infrastructure solutions like putting up seawalls. Um, Ayana? Um, I'm curious to hear Jeff's answer, but and and certainly he sort of touched on this in in the context of um, coastal ecosystems, wetlands in particular, but also mangroves and um, oyster reefs and coral reefs um, and and sea grasses. That these ecosystems have the potential to protect us from storms in particular, and if they can sort of keep up with the rate of sea level rise from, from, from those things too. But, you know, as Jeff also described, we've basically developed a large portion of our, our coastline, especially in cities, right? So there's not very much ecosystem left to do that buffering. But one of the things that we've seen is for example, in the, um, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean, was that in 2005? Um, mm -hmm. What we saw along, you know, which parts of um, Indonesia were most impacted um, 
was places that still had mangroves intact actually did much better because they um, buffered the impact of the waves that were coming ashore. I mean, all of this sort of like natural infrastructure, these these roots and branches sort of slowed things down. Um, and a lot of um, Southeast Asia has, you know, mo a lot of mangroves have been bulldozed and removed because people don't like that there are mosquitoes there or it's muddy or they want to use those places for aquaculture and shrimp farming. Um, and so places that um, had removed their mangroves actually, you know, suffered a lot worse damage. And we see something similar in New York City with um, Superstorm Sandy, which is that, you know, New York City had already destroyed 85% of its wetlands, New York and New Jersey, before that hurricane hit. But the remaining 15% actually prevented hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. Um, and so, you know, these ecosystems are, are certainly threatened by development and, and climate change and sea level rise, but whatever we can do to both protect what's left and restore um, as much as we can um, literally pays for itself. Um, and can, can often be like less expensive and more effective than, than seawalls. And we can't sort of wall off the entire ocean, right? Like, as I mentioned, New York City alone has almost 600 miles of coastline. So we can't just put up a 20 foot wall around all of that. So we need to come up with solutions that are a combination of um, nature-based solutions as they're called. And then also thinking about like, maybe there are some places where we don't keep rebuilding and we sort of like move some of our infrastructure and, and homes away from the coast in these places where we know they're just going to keep getting pummeled. Jeff, did you want to Historically, add historically New York had a very um, expansive um, oyster reef uh, there, which um, we actually did a study a few years ago sort of exploring, we, we were interested following Sandy to try to, to reconstruct Sandy-like events by looking in, in coastal ponds there. And one of the questions we had was, well, there used to be oyster reefs all over the place and now there aren't. What you know, role might they have played in sort of changing how we might uh, record these sorts of events in, in these coastal ponds? And it made a really big difference. Um, so you know, we basically modeled it with oyster reefs and without and it didn't impact the total water level that was achieved, the storm surge, but it made a big difference in terms of the waves that impacted on the coast. Um, and that's obviously the part that does a lot of the damage in terms of both to the ecosystems, but also to, to our infrastructure. And so, you know, it's not just that we've put all this stuff in harm's way, but that we've changed the natural system in such a way to make ourselves um, more vulnerable. Where did the data come from to do that comparison? Were you just sort of um, well, there's lots of historic data or? about, because people harvested the oysters, right? So oh, okay. there's lots of information about where the reefs were and, and, and how long they were there and, and when they disappeared. So it was fairly easy to sort of reconstruct the, the early um, um, map view of what the, the oyster reefs looked like. Interesting. Um, there's a question here from Elva is there traditional knowledge in relation to sea level change that we need to be aware of and engage with in our decision making and policy making process? Ayana, you talked about that Actually, to some extent with respect to Coruscant. I don't really know the answer to that question. The one anecdote that comes to mind for me is in particular, um, um, indigenous peoples on the West Coast um, knowing that tsunamis were something that happened historically through, you know, the oral history that was passed down through generations, did not build their settlements right on the coast, right? They built them uphill and came down to harvest and then went back up. Um, and, and so I think that sort of that wisdom of, you know, storms are a thing that happen. Tsunamis are a thing that happen. Like, why would we build in harm's way in, instead of just like going to the ocean? Um, and it doesn't have to be that far, but sort of the hubris of modern coastal development. We have like literally so many buildings falling off cliffs. I'm out here um, on Long Island and there are so many homes that are, you know, that their stairs down to the beach have fallen off um, and the homes have to be sort of like, re-engineered and held up because we built at the edge of a cliff that's been slowly crumbling. 
And, you know, some of that might be related to our changing climate and weather patterns that exacerbate erosion. But some of it is just like humans, like what were we thinking, right? We're just building in places that people who listen to indigenous wisdom never would have built. It was not a very specific answer, but a general sort of like, um, sort of like incredibly um, Western and perhaps even American approach to um, just to saying like, we can live wherever we want. We will just like engineer it and make it happen and we can control nature. And even after, you know, all of these fires in California, people want to rebuild in the same places where the fire risk is only increasing because of climate change. People want to rebuild in the same places after hurricanes. And some of that is the way our insurance um, and FEMA um, systems work that you're sort of like incentivized or even required to rebuild in the same place to get those funds. Um, but some of it is just like human psychology is a total mess when it comes to like, you know, I will be fine or like the next one won't be for a while or, um, or we'll like engineer some magical solution. Um, and this, this like very magical thinking um, that we could somehow control nature has, has gotten us into a lot of trouble and has sort of delayed, I think, the important action we need on climate change because there's this deep seated belief that somehow we'll like just figure it out later. Um, and that a bunch of engineers in the room will solve all our problems, which is like, I don't think it's gonna happen. We're gonna have to just all sort of like pitch in and change policy and, and start today. Jeff, do you agree that we're kind of to blame and that we're putting ourselves in, in harm's way from hurricanes? And what, what are the biggest challenges that you see with, with confronting hurricanes? No, I, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, and it's not just indigenous peoples, you know, are the ancestors of, of people that are living on the coast. Now we're smart enough not to build cities on barrier islands, right? I mean, you, you look at early charts of of New Jersey, for example, um, the barrier islands in the 19th century had some fishing shacks and salt works on them, right? All the, the people actually lived much further up and in, uh, in higher elevations, right? So, you know, it really wasn't until the middle part of the 20th century where we went crazy and we just started building um, everywhere. Um, you know, you look at someplace like Atlantic City, it's, you know, maybe six feet above sea level. Yeah, and so you built this urban area on this, you know, uh, fragile landform that is at a very low elevation. So, um, and now you know we know that sea level is rising, right? And, and so, you know, every day those communities get more and more at risk. They're getting, you know, closer and closer to to, to sea level. You know, and Sandy's a really good example. Here of of Atlantic City. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I'm just wondering what are we seeing here. Uh, oh yeah, so this this is a so on the left there is a chart that sort of like I was describing, of um, that's the the stretch of coast where Atlantic City is today in 1833, and then there's a, a satellite image of Atlantic City um, today, um, and you can see we've taken this barrier island and the marshes behind it and filled it in and and built a mm -hmm. urban setting, um, and so you know now there's millions and millions of people in harm's way all along the. Um, New Jersey Shore, and if you go back to the 19th century, there wasn't anybody there. Um, so, you know, and, and hurricanes are infrequent enough that, you know, we don't often have a personal experience with a really intense one. Um, you know, for example, in the, in the Northeast, the, the last really intense hurricane to strike was, was 1938, right? So there's not too many people left around that actually remember that storm. Um, and you know, prior to that, you had to go back to, to 1869 or um, 1815, for example. Actually, today's the 205th anniversary of the great um, September gale of 1815. So we had a, a category three hurricane that plowed into um, the, the Long Island in, in Southern New England um, and caused devastation. There's, there's an image there, it's a, a painting uh, that's actually up in the Rhode Island Historical Society of downtown Providence um, in this 1815 gale. And of course that repeated itself in, in 1938 
um, where downtown Providence was also flooded like that. And then it repeated itself again in, in uh, Hurricane Carol a few years later. Um, and so that the, one of my points was that, that they're infrequent enough that we often don't have uh, memory of it ourselves. And even as a society tend to forget that, you know, these sorts of events can happen. And, you know, with that short sightedness, we build things like Atlantic City or even, you know, just building um, uh, houses and infrastructure that are just far too close to the ocean. All right, uh, let's see what we've got here from the audience. And I was going to say earlier um, it was a yeah. really good example of, you know, it was, you know, barely hurricane strength, right? Um, and the reason it caused so much damage wasn't its intensity. It was a large storm, but it wasn't very intense. The reason it caused so much damage is because we put so many people and so much of our stuff in harm's way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, There's a, a sort of a debate, not a debate. There's um there's there's a sort of like a rule of thumb when we talk about extreme weather events that we shouldn't call them natural disasters because if humans hadn't built all this stuff there it wouldn't be a disaster it'd just be like a hurricane on a deserted beach right it's the way that we have um, built our societies that creates the disaster. It's the way that we have not prepared for um, the humanitarian and emergency responses we need that create the disaster, right? Nature isn't the disaster. And so I've started to call, um, you know, these sorts of extreme weather events that are fueled and worsened by climate change, unnatural disasters, um, because these are things that would not be happening otherwise in the same way. And I think that's important to note, like nature's not the enemy. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's there, but it does sort of point at a need to rethink how we, how we prepare for and adapt to this changing climate when it comes to storms and, you know, what that means to take care of each other, especially in the context where our federal government is clearly not able to respond thoroughly and quickly in the aftermath of these extreme weather events. And that's a trend that's been um, getting worse and worse over the last few years. So what does that, what does that mean for how we um, need to prepare ourselves as individuals, as communities um, on the local government level when you can't trust that help is going to come quickly, right? Like how can we um, make sure that we're, we're thinking through what that means? We have an interesting question here from someone whose name I'm going to probably horribly mispronounce. It looks like Jabico, possibly. Um, Policy-wise, how can we make sea level rise a priority with so much of the country inland and I guess so much of the population being inland? So 40% of Americans live in coastal counties, as was one of the opening um, multiple choice questions. And so um, I think that that to me helps like four in 10 Americans are living in places that um, either their own homes or the infrastructure they depend on is is threatened by sea level rise to some degree. Um, so I think that's helpful to know. And about a third of Americans live in coastal cities. And so I think it's important to separate that population density um, information from this question of like the coastal elite, because um, you know that's a term that gets thrown around a lot. I mean, the, coast, the coasts are also the center of a lot of power and money in this country, but it's also where just like a lot of Americans live. Um, and so it's important to think about the challenges there. Um, so the short answer is like, I don't really know how to make people care about that. Um, sometimes I joke that I wish I'd gotten a degree in psychology if I actually wanted to be useful at conservation because it's about like, like sort of like winning hearts and minds, right? Like how do you change the way that people see the world? How do you make people care about each other um, even if they're not related or have no financial ties. And I think that's the question that, you know, comes up over and over and over again, because when it comes to a lot of these larger um, impacts of climate change, it's about sharing resources and, and preparing for a future that, you know, we don't know which thing is going to affect us um, or when, but we know, 
you know, climate change is sort of coming for all of us. It's just a matter of what form that will take. Um, and so I think we do really need to think about how we, how we put just more care for humanity into all of these decisions around how we adapt to um, our changing climate. And I wish I had the answer to that, <laughs> um, but I, I'm not really sure I know. I, I want to make sure I get in this this question before we have to wrap up. But um, Ayana, you've written how racism is getting in the way of of work on climate change. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection you see there, and and yeah. how addressing racism and addressing climate change are are related to one another? Sure. Um, in two ways. Uh, one is on who's impacted. We know that um, communities of color and poor communities are often the hardest hit by pollution, um, often by storms. A lot of public housing in New York City is built in low-lying flood prone areas. For example, if we think about who lives near fossil fuel refineries and has to breathe that dirty air, um, which puts people at a higher risk for extreme forms of coronavirus, for example. All of these things are connected. Our, our housing policy, our, um, our energy policy, um, and, and, and when and where we enforce um, infractions on um, water and air pollution, like which communities have the resources to make sure that nature is protected. And that's sort of this concept of environmental justice that we all deserve a safe and healthy environment. Um, and you know, when it comes to climate change, people with the fewest resources, you know, it's not just like a beach house that you can just go to your other house. It's like, that's where you live. That's maybe where your family has lived for generations. Um, so figuring, figuring that part out is, is super, super challenging. Um, that's one of the things, you know, we're going to be focusing on at Urban Ocean Lab. My think tank is what does managed retreat look like? This concept that we need to actually move away from the coast in some areas. And how do we do that in a way that is equitable and just? But on the other side, we know that we, you know, that not just on who's, who's impacted, but who could be a part of the solution. Um, climate and justice are intertwined. So we know from um, based on polling done by Yale and George Mason universities that people of color are actually more concerned about climate than white people. It's 49% um, of white people are, are really concerned about climate change compared to 57% of black people and 69% of Latinx people. So on just like a practical, tactical aspect of this, like shouldn't we be deliberately including the people who are already concerned and motivated to work on solutions? Um, and if so, how can we lift these other burdens off of those communities? Um, white supremacy and all the forms uh, that racism takes so that people don't have to worry about, you know, their rights to live and breathe um, and, you know, and dealing with um, our sort of mass incarceration and um, very violent policing in the United States um, and instead could say like, well, I, I already really care about climate now that I don't have to worry about my, um, my, my rights, I can actually contribute more of my time and energy to saving the planet. So I think of it as just like a huge drain on the intellectual um, capacity and creativity of communities of color to, to to participate in climate solutions and lead their communities in that transformation. And so um, sort of on both sides, on who's impacted by the problem and on who you know, can and, and would like to be a part of the solution, I think um, we need to understand that these, these issues are connected. We've talked about a lot of big issues tonight and I wanna end with this one last question from, uh, from our audience, uh, from Dawn. Um, and maybe both of you can take a stab at, at answering it in different ways. How would you recommend teachers and parents encourage young people who might feel stressed or apathetic because the problem of, of climate change just seems too big? Mm -hmm. You first, Jeff. Um, well, I, I sort of follow on what Ayana was just saying about, I mean, this is sort of a, a problem that we've created. We shouldn't feel helpless, right? Um, it's not an act of God that we have no sort of means of sort of defending ourselves against. We've put ourselves in this position and we're equipped to get ourselves out of it, right? So I would be one piece of advice um, I would offer, right? And it's gonna be hard, it's gonna cost a lot, it's gonna take a lot of effort, um, but we're, we're equipped to do it. 
So one of my answers is actually a project that was sort of flashing across the screen when we started, which is um, this book that I um, co-edited, which is called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. And this is where I get a lot of my motivation and inspiration. It's um, just published this week. Um, I know that there's... Um, there's like a discount that Hui is offering for folks who want to buy it, which is rad. Um, and it's essays by 41 women climate leaders, um, including people who work on coastal cities and, and seaweed farming and um, um, marine landscape architecture um, and, and atmospheric chemistry and soil science and policy and politics and activism and art and design. Um, and journalism and hearing all of their stories about the way forward, I find to be really motivating. And I know a lot of teachers are using this book um, in schools because everybody is wanting that same thing, right? What do we actually do? Um, like we get it, climate change is a problem. It's only like seven or 8% of Americans who are denying climate science. The rest of us are like, okay, but what do we do? Um, and I think of each one of the essays in this book as an answer to that, as one of the doors that we can sort of walk through as a way to participate in climate solutions. So I would just say to those who, you know, who haven't quite found their role in this work yet, um, there's an opportunity to think about what are you good at and then how can you use that to contribute to the solutions we need. Are you a web designer or a lawyer or a teacher? Um, are you an organizer or an artist? Um, do people just like listen to you and think you're really cool? Like whatever your thing is, how can you use that to contribute? Um, in addition to the things that we should sort of all be doing, we need everyone to bring like their special magic to this. Um, but yes, we should all also be voting to make sure we have politicians who understand um, what good climate policy looks like um, and joining things. And that's the last thing I'll say. I mean, people often feel like they're in this alone um, and sort of like curating this book was a big exercise for me and like, we're actually not alone. Um, and, you know, I think maybe the best part of this book is the part at the end that just lists all the organizations you can you can volunteer with or join, whether that's your local chapter of the Sierra Club or the Sunrise Movement or 350.org or Fridays for Future, right? There's all these different ways um, to contribute your skills. So um, for all of you out there trying to figure out like, ah, what do I actually do? Um, I would encourage you not to go, go it alone. And um, yeah, and this book for me has been a real source of inspiration. So um, maybe it will be for you too. And I'd say no one is too young to, to start contributing to those solutions. We've Absolutely. Seen lots of great examples of students uh, trying to work on these issues. All right. Well, unfortunately, I would love to keep talking, but that's all we have time for tonight. Um, before anyone signs off, though, we do have a short video to show you tonight. It's called Who is Hui? And it'll introduce you to some of the Hui scientists, engineers, and technicians who are pushing the frontiers of ocean research. You'll also get a sense of just the incredible breadth of topics and questions that our researchers investigate. I also want to remind you that in honor of Climate Week, Hui has launched the Together for Science campaign. Now more than ever, we need science believers in order to advance our understanding of the ocean. For over 90 years, Hui has been on call for our ocean and has been pivotal in discoveries, including historic Eureka moments. Right now, we need more Eureka moments, and, and we can't do it without you. Like drops in the ocean that can form a wave, we can join forces, uh, and we are more powerful. Together, we can do it better. Please consider a gift to Hui during this unprecedented time. You can learn more at go.hui.edu forward slash together. And uh, that address is up on your screen right now. Um, if you'd like to visibly show your support for Hui, you can consider checking out our online store at shop.hui.edu. We've got some great swag and clothes like this cool t-shirt that I'm wearing uh, together for science. And just for uh, joining us at this event tonight, you'll get a 15% discount. Um, just type in the discount code OCEAN as you're checking out. And we do have Ayana's book as well. 
uh, for sale. So um, before we go to the Hui video, I want to say one more big, big thank you to Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Jeff Donnelly for sharing your insights about climate change and the future of coastal cities. It's been a remarkable and inspiring evening, and we look forward to hearing more about your work in the future and to reading your new book, Ayana. Thank you so much for having me. Jeff, it was great to be in conversation with you. Yeah, same here. And I also want to thank all of my Hui colleagues who have been working very hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And to all of you who joined us, thank you. Tonight's event was the second in our fall season. Our next ocean encounter will be actually in two weeks, so not next Wednesday, but the following one on Wednesday, October 7th at 7.30 p.m. It's going to be a somewhat different format uh, for us from previous ocean encounters. We'll be hosting an evening of storytelling about the sea. We're calling it the stories we tell, sea stories from ancient oral traditions to modern day pirates. So we'll hope you'll join us for that. To register or find out more information about our Ocean Encounter series, please visit the website, which is hui.edu forward slash ocean hyphen encounters. That's also where you'll find videos of all of our past events, including uh, tonight's. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you again to everyone and enjoy the video. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place, full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean, want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of the planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society, it's all connected. What Hui does is it brings all those scientists together. The world's best talent in ocean sciences. We learn from each other, we develop opportunities together. It's a fourth multiplier. It feels like 130,000 scientists. I can pull together a team from either my department or other departments at Hui to really tackle any problem. Having all the support is what makes Hui unique and enables me to do good science. Hui is at the cutting edge of that mix between science and engineering and it allows us to ask questions that most other places can't ask. You can come up with ideas, put them into action, and actually deliver results all in a short time frame. Vehicle technology, AUV technology, seafloor instrumentation, sensor development. You get the world-class reputation, but you've also got amazing ships and engineering that allow you access to places that most other scientists can't get to. You can see further, you can go further, you can reduce your risk, and you can do it less expensively. It's really amazing for me to be able to walk out of my lab, cross the street, and get on to the research vessel that can take me anywhere around the world. I've been to remote reefs in the Maldives and the Micronesia. I've dived on both the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise, and very few people have actually been down there and seen that. We've looked at these turbulent storms in the ocean and how they create upwellings of nutrients. We're able to collect samples and see how these systems change in real time. Just imagine you are diving, you are reaching the bottom of the sea mount. All of a sudden you see a cloud. As we get closer, we see these objects that were aggregated like in a mass, and you say, what is that? The sense of isolation, you can almost feel the ocean closing over your head as you submerge. You can learn a tremendous amount just by being in the environment. Some things have struck me in the middle of the night. It clicks and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something really huge. It's that aspect of discovery, finding out something new, something that's never been seen before, creates an incredible drive within Hui scientists, engineers, and technicians. It's such a compelling place to be so dynamic and so many opportunities that it attracts really smart and dedicated students and young scientists. So I was reading those papers about amazing science that was coming out of Hui. Now that I'm here, I get to actually interact with the people who wrote those papers. The positive feedback and the collaboration finally made me decide, oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I can be a scientist. It's incumbent on us to perpetuate the cycle of education and research and discovery. People all over the world need to recognize the role that the ocean plays in their daily life, even if they don't live near the coast. It affects weather, it affects food resources, it affects climate. 
tides are changing, the temperature's changing, the salinity's changing. Climate change and overfishing are the biggest threats to coral reefs right now. How will the ocean respond to global warming? We have to understand our planet in order to be good stewards of it. We need to get the understanding into the hands of everyone from the general public to people responsible for making policy decisions. It's probably more important now than it ever was. We are very eager to provide answers for those critical questions that we must address now, and we have the tools and the means to provide these answers. This is the best place on the planet to do the sorts of things that we're doing. Institutions around the world look to Hui as a leader in pushing the envelope. Concepts that were developed here are understood as the basis for oceanography all over the world. I'm proud to be from Hui. There's no place on Earth I'd rather be. We have the potential to change the world. It's not just about this planet, it's about life in the broadest possible terms.